Today's sermon continues, and if you're joining us for the first time, we are not only big picture, preaching through and reading through the gospel according to St. Luke, which is a very extensive gospel, but we're also, the latter part of this spring and heading into the summer, in a little sermon series that embeds in Luke's gospel on prayer because this is what the gospel invites us to focus on. So we're focusing on prayer uh, the last several Sundays and for the next several as we move through June. Today's sermon is, Father, hallowed be your name. Father, hallowed be your name. Number one prayer. We all want to know who or what is number one. Well, here it is. Father, hallowed be your name, number one prayer. Now we're going to be turning to two passages of scripture today. In a moment, we'll be back to Luke chapter 11, verse 2. But before we go there, I'm going to include a passage from the prophet Ezekiel, uh, which is part of a larger series of prophecies by Ezekiel about God bringing the new covenant and bringing redemption and renewal, ending the exile and establishing a way through which God somehow himself is going to bring rebirth, new hearts and people, uh, the new covenant, and ultimately the temple uh, beyond anything physically ever understood in Jerusalem. So right in the midst of that, we read this passage of scripture which I want you to pay attention to to because Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, is connecting to this passage of scripture in the way he teaches us to pray and telling us that we are to pray for what is prophesied in Ezekiel when we pray in his way. He, Jesus, the Messiah, the one who will bring this to bear, is inviting us into the story. Okay, so first, hear now God's word from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 21 through 27. And you'll pay attention to the high focus on God upholding, God personally upholding his own holy name, okay? Here it is, Ezekiel 36, picking up at verse 21. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And then to Jesus teaching us how to pray in this direction. Luke 11 the first three segments of verse 2. And he said to them, when you, when y'all, plural, pray, say, Father, may your name be honored as holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Now, I have a great invitation to you today. If you're interested in being in eternal life with Jesus, do I have anyone here interested in eternally living with Jesus? Okay, well, part of my calling 
is to uh, turn to the Lord and instruct not only myself, but also you in how to practice and prepare for being with Jesus forever. Because I don't want there to be blood on my hands, um, and I don't want you all showing up and you know, they're in the great congregation of the eternal communion of God and you being clueless as to what everybody's talking about and what you're supposed to be doing. I certainly don't want the angel saying, maybe she shouldn't be here. Maybe he, he shouldn't be here. So I want you today to learn to understand that you are practicing one part of the prayer that Jesus gives us, the way of praying, that we'll exclaim forever. It's the one part of the prayer we will exclaim forever. Father, hallowed be your name. Now, you know that's the way we traditionally say the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, the hagios theite is hard to translate. Uh, it's directed toward God, and you know we're certainly not commanding God to do something, right? But we're, we're asking for God's name to be, uh, to be honored as holy. So I've translated, may your name be honored as holy, so we can focus on what's being said. Now, this is the number one prayer. You know, we're all very interested in, as I said, who's number one, what's number one, who is number one for you? Let me just ask that. If I, if I said, when you wake up in the morning, who's the first person you think about? Or what's the first thing you think about? That kind of gives you an indication of who's number one, right? Uh, if I said, well, what do you spend most of your time and money focused on? Well, that's probably gonna indicate who's number one, right? So. What I want to focus on today is the number one prayer that points us to the number one person that in the good news I invite you to know as number one. Okay, so let's pull back and remind ourselves this is something I'll repeat in various ways throughout this series. Prayer is very interesting because it tells, it cuts down to the core of who you are, where you are spiritually, morally, emotionally, and everything else. Prayer is the clearest expression of our faith and of our relationship with God. Your prayer, your prayer life, is the clearest expression of what you actually, for real, believe and what your relationship with God is. It, high level theology, it's your theology. In other words, the way you talk, what you pray about, when you pray, reveals what your faith actually is, okay, and what you actually think about God, and where you think you are in relationship to God. And if you said to me, I don't pray very much, so I can't get a good indicator of that, I'll tell you, you've just given me all the indication you needed to give me. You don't think much of God. Your theology is very low. You're more focused on yourself and the things of this world. So this is, going to be, this is going to be in direct relation. I, I guarantee you this, from, from a systematic theologian who sits in an endowed chair and talks all the time about so-called theology, all the way through a person in the chairs or the pews of a church, just give me their prayer life for a week. Let me analyze what was said, when it was said, how it was said, and I'll tell you what the real theology is. It's where the rubber hits the road. It's the clearest expression. Your prayer life, or lack thereof, is the clearest expression of your faith, if there is any faith going on there, and your relationship with God. So let me go even a little bit more pointedly for a moment. If, when, how, and for what we pray is the surest evidence of what we actually think of God and of ourselves, but more than that, who our God really is. I'll come back to that. I want you thinking about that, but let me go ahead and go to this how we pray. Jesus and the Bible as a whole call out various types of false prayer, false praying. These include pagan praying, pagan praying, hypocrites praying, or hypocritical praying, and parrot praying. Now, in some other sermons coming up, I'll come back to the parrot praying a little bit more and the hypocritical praying. But a parrot praying obviously tells you, okay, you're talking about somebody who just repeats words like a parrot. In other words, I could teach a very advanced parrot to recite the Lord's Prayer. 
is the parrot actually a born-again Christian? No. But man, a parrot could probably say the words better than some of us could, right? In fact, if I got a parrot with an English accent or a Scott accent, you would say, oh wow, that parrot is awesome. That parrot never had to look at his notes. In fact, that parrot said it so well with such conviction. I think that parrot is probably an apostolic leader of the church. No, it's a parrot who learns some things. Okay, there are people who can parrot words from the Bible who have no real prayer life and no real relationship with God. I'll come back to that later, but for today, I wanna to focus on kind of related pagan praying, pagan praying, which is often hypocritical <laughs> and parroting as well. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles, in other words, as the pagans do. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Ever been around people who just pile up words and prayers that just seem to be a bunch of words? Well, let me give you an actual direct, literal example of the way pagans prayed at the time of the New Testament. This is from well, about 70 years after Jesus, a Latin novel, um, Apuleius's Metamorphoses, which has another name that I won't mention. And here's a prayer, just an excerpted prayer from here. The protagonist prays, O oh, blessed Queen of Heaven, whether you are the Dame Ceres, motherly source of all fruitful things, or whether you are Celestial Venus, who in the first moment of creation mingled the opposing sexes in the generation of mutual desires, or whether you are the sister of Phoebus, who by relieving the pangs of childbirth, travail with soothing remedies have brought safe into the world, lives innumerable, or whether you are terrible, uh, pro serpini, by reason of deadly howling you yield that has the power to stop and put away the invasion of the hags and the ghost. You who are worshiped in diverse manners, with whatsoever name or fashion, it is lawful to call upon you. I pray in my great travail. In other words, we're talking about just throwing spaghetti on the wall, right? Somebody out there, or I know there are a whole lot of gods and goddesses, whoever is intersecting my present situation, whether it's this goddess, this goddess, this goddess, this goddess. By the way, if you were a Hindu, you know there are over a million uh, deities in Hinduism. Man, if you got in trouble, is it this, is it Shiva this time, or Vishnu, or one of their sons or daughters, or wonder who, whom I need to call on today, because whoever is intersecting my thing, right? So this is an example. Jesus says, don't keep piling up words like you don't know to whom you're praying. I'm inviting you to know the Father, right? So see how Jesus is radically different and calling us to a radically different religion than the world practices, right? Jesus says, when you pray, know to whom you're praying and know that you're invited into a relationship with him through me. It's really short. You don't have to go off, you know, naming a bunch of names and all this kind of stuff. Father. And then, may your name be honored as holy. So, let's look at the structure. We'll return to this for several Sundays. The way to pray according to Jesus. It's a way of praying. This is, not, this is the only prayer we're supposed to pray. It gives us a model of the order, how to order our souls and our lives for prayer, right? First of all, we have the address, the address to the Father, which is direct, intimate, trusting, and obedient. Now, I'll remind you, and I'll remind you again, if you missed last week's sermon, you really need to go back to that one. Our Father, pray as his child. It's the May 26th sermon for Trinity Sunday. It's, it's the basis of the relationship of prayer. You don't want to miss that sermon. But now let's move on from the address to we have uh, Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount has three of these. Luke has two of them. They're what I'm calling, this is just my title for them, Adoration Petitions. Okay, so they're not like other types of petitions. They're adoring God and looking to God first. And they're framed in, in terms of thou and thy and thee. 
to God, okay? So they're adoring the Father, and they are ask, asking, but, but, but they are asked that pertain to first adoring God, okay? The thou and thy prayers. So Matthew has three of these, Luke has two. But they totally go together because honestly, if his, if his name is upheld as holy and his kingdom comes, his will will be done on, on earth and is in heaven, okay? And then uh, we're gonna go later to the supplication petitions. Supplication means that God is gonna supply to us. That's where that name comes from, okay? So we get to those later. Give us our daily bread, okay? Forgive us our debts or our sins. Um, deliver us from evil. So Matthew has four of these because he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Luke has three. He simply goes directly to deliver us from evil. Okay. So that's the structure of the way Jesus is teaching us to pray. Again, we'll go over this for several Sundays. To whom and how the address. I've mentioned this. Let me remind you again, this is key. You've got to know whom you are addressing and what your relationship is, is with him. And last week's sermon dug into that very deeply. Our Father, pray as his child. Go back and catch that or review it even if you heard it. And we saw last week that the gospel is this. Jesus, the very Son of God, invites us to come beside him by God's grace. Like, I don't belong to this family, but Jesus invites us into this family so that I can pray directly beside Jesus to his Father as our Father. And Jesus unites us in relationship with himself and his Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So for Trinity Sunday, we focused on how Trinitarian that good news is, right? So that's what's going on with the prayer. Now, let's get back to you and me, though, in the real world. How, when, and for what I pray reveals my true God. Let me repeat that. How, when, and for what I pray reveals my true God. What I pray for and when I pray and what prompts me to pray reveals what I actually adore, what I count on, what I find my identity, my cause, and my community in. So in other words, I'm getting you into the opportunity to, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and analyze where you are spiritually now. My number one prayer prompter and my number one prayer for real in the real world, the way I've been praying, reveals my true God. And you'll notice God there is lowercase g on purpose. In other words, if I'm worried about money all the time, and what rouses me to actually pray, even though I don't normally pray very much, when I'm worried about money, I start talking to God a lot. Is God my real God? No, money is. I'm using God to address my real concern, which is money. What I actually adore and need and want is money. If my child, now by the way, it's totally good. Parents, you need to pray for your children. Understand this, but with that qualification, if the honest truth is, when I really pray and pray passionately is when I'm worried about my child. I just told myself, my child is elevated above God because I only go to God when I need help with my child. And I actually adore my child. I don't really adore God that much, but I need God for the God that I actually adore, which is my child or my family or my marriage. Or can I get pregnant this year? You see, you see it reveals what your real God is. If I'm, the, what I'm always praying about is our nation. Again, you should pray for our nation. But the truth is I'm always just praying about politics and politicians and the nation. Well, that just told me I've elevated the nation and politics and politicians above God. Because I only go to God when I need help with what I'm really concerned about and what I really adore, which is my favorite politicians and my favorite nation, the United States of America. Again, it's good to pray for the nation. You should pray for this nation. This nation needs a whole lot of prayer right now. But if the truth is I've got the order out of order, I'm disordered spiritually, and I've got the wrong religion. 
If I'm worried about getting tenure, and that's what really wakes me up in the morning to talk to God so God can help me with what I really need. My kid can be really good at baseball. My kid can be really good at softball. My daughter can make the cheerleading team. My daughter can make the all-star softball team, whatever. That just told me my religion and where I find my real passion in and what I really adore is my daughter making the softball team. And I'm going to use God to try to get what I really want, my real God and my real religion. So in other words, the question is, are my prayers mainly about God and secondarily about secondary things, like whether my daughter makes the softball team, or are they out of kilter and out of order? My real God, is it money? Is it family? Success? Romance? The nation? Or is my real adoration about God and then flowing from an adoration for God, I do get to my child, the nation, my career. With Jesus, here's the way to pray. After the address to God the Father, what's my number one prayer? What's it going to be? So I make the all-star team? So I get the bonus at the end of the year? No. My number one prayer is going to begin with this first couple of adoration petitions. And today we're doing the very first one, the number one. It's all about God and God's name being upheld. And if my daughter makes the softball team, may we be upholding your name, Father, in the way she acts and in the way we act and the way we talk. Get it? Adoration petitions, thou and thy. As I said, Matthew has three of these. Luke 11 gives us two. They go along with each other. And in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, and Luke chapter 11, the first, the number one prayer of adoration petition is, may your name be honored as holy. If you don't pray anything else today, that should be your prayer. If you want to know what, if I'm a born-again, spirit-led Christian, what should get me out of bed praying first thing in the morning, it's that prayer. It's not the things that come later and come under that. Don't elevate what is secondary to the top. Now, let's look more deeply at what Jesus is teaching about God, about our relationship with God, about our expression of our relationship with God in prayer. How should our hearts and souls, our prayer life and our lives be ordered? Well, first of all, again, number one, awe and adoration come first. Awe and adoration come first. This is in the sermon notes. You can follow along with this as well, but I'm going to lay it out for you. Number one, what comes first? Awe and adoration. This is what Jesus is teaching us. And here's the good news. Understand, this is not oppressive. This is good news. This will set you free. Everybody understand, this will set you free. Awe and adoration coming first banishes anxiety and needs to come before our ask, our asking for ourselves. Jesus says, do not be anxious about all these things. Look, your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But as we'll say next week, seek first the kingdom, Jesus says. Awe and adoration comes for us, banishing anxiety. We are invited to love, call on, trust, and yield to the Father as a child who's a member of his house. So think about it. If I'm all worried about my medical diagnosis, and that's what's driving me. I'm a slave to that. I'm a slave to anxiety and fear about my medical analysis, right? What are they going to say when I go to the doctor next week? If I'm all worried about whether my daughter makes the softball team, and that's driving me, I'm anxious and I'm a slave of that. Jesus is inviting you and me, Christians, to be set free not to be ruled and enslaved by worry all the time about whether she makes the softball team, whether they come back and say it's malignant, whether I get that promotion or not. 
because those are not your saviors. Those are not your gods, okay? You will not live in eternity based on whether your daughter makes the softball team or whether it's malignant or not. Do you understand? Jesus is inviting you to be set free to come to the living God who gives eternal communion. Whether you live or die of the cancer right now in the grand scheme of eternity is frankly not that important. It's a living relationship with the living God. So you can be set free. Jesus says, look, and Paul says, look, turn your anxieties over. Turn your anxieties over and with prayer and supplication and petition and all thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Yes, of course you can come to God as your father and say, I'm worried about this medical situation. Of course you can. But you go first to him and trust in him and adore him first. And you actually love him first. And you know that your heart and your treasure is in him. That's what's going on here. And that sets you free from your anxieties and your self-focus. Give yourself to God and he'll give you yourself back only infinitely better because you belong to him now. That's the gospel invitation. So that's number one. Number two, always attend to the grace. It's the grace, okay, as well as the gravity and the greatness of God's name. In Moses' famous encounter at Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai with the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, what does Moses beg God to give him? Anybody know? His name. Because in the Old Testament, and frankly, in the entire Bible, in God's economy, God's name is the same as who God is. If you actually know and have a relationship with God's name, you have a living relationship with God. So God gives him his name, Yahweh, the Lord. I am who I am, I will be who I will be. And I'm studying Deuteronomy right now in Sunday school. It's all over Deuteronomy. The place and the people on whom God puts his name are set apart as belonging to God. God's really serious about his name. And of course, um, we know the third commandment, right? Children, you know the third commandment. You shall not take the what? Name of the Lord your God in vain. Is that a secondary commandment about not cursing using God's name? No. What that's saying is if you have a relationship with God and he's put his name on you, Israel, you better not take that for granted. Anything you do that's inconsistent with God is defiling the name of God. Okay? As a Christian, I am saved in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm named as what? A Christian, right? So if I do things tomorrow or this week or say things that are inconsistent with Jesus and his holy name, I am taking his name in vain. The name is the same, right, as God himself. So you can go back and read that devotional I sent out on Thursday for you to think about in your prayer life. Are there ways in which I'm not upholding the name of Jesus in my life? And repenting and turning and asking God to strengthen me so that my life would honor the name of Jesus, my Savior. Um, Ezekiel 36 made this really clear, right? We're talking about God's name. You'll notice that it's interchangeable. God's name, God, and God's holiness. You could say, well, which one is it? And I would say, yeah, the answer is yes. They're, they're all the same. In the New Testament, listen to this. The New Testament says at various times, we are saved by believing in Jesus but it also says we're saved by believing in the name of Jesus. Again, that's, there's your St. John's Gospel reference, John 1, verse 12. But to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children's, children of God, right? And you could say to me, but Pastor Martin, which one is it? I believe in Jesus or I believe in his name? And I would say, yes. It's the same. Like, you believe that he is the Lord's salvation. You believe in his name. He is his name. His name is him. Salvation comes by calling on God's name. Romans verse, chapter 10, verse 13, same as Joel 2, 32. We believe in Jesus' name. Now, to us, number three, but we're going to move on from number three in a moment. As part of the first prayer, we pray then for ourselves that we would hallow and not profane his holy name. In other words, we're praying for our sanctification. Lord, sanctify me. You've saved me, 
Now, by your Holy Spirit, please sanctify me that I might turn from things that dishonor your name and be consistent with you. This is the prayer. Paul says this is God's will for us. Sometimes people say, I want to pray for God's will in my life. I'll say, okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, right? What's the will of God for us? Paul puts it very bluntly. Our sanctification, that we would be holy and honor the name of the living God in our lives. That's what God wants. How are we baptized? Into the what? Name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we unite in Jesus' name, he's present. Jesus says this, wherever two or three are gathered in what? My name. I will be, how do we pray? We pray in what? The name of Jesus. Which then brings us to number four. Honestly, before praying for ourselves, again, remember this, before number three above, we first praise Jesus and pray for his coming. We give thanks for his first coming and we pray for his return. See, Christ the King, when he came, perfectly hallowed God's name, and he will hallow God's name in fulfillment when he comes again. We'll get to this next week, but that, this blends right into thy kingdom come. In fact, you'll notice in Ezekiel 36, only the Lord can answer the prayer. That's what Ezekiel 36 is saying. Look at this. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Well, how's he going to do that? He's going to come to us. This is a prophecy about Jesus' coming. And notice this. I will vindicate my holiness. But I thought you were going to vindicate your name. They're the same. Okay? They're the same. So, Lord's word by way of Ezekiel the prophet. New covenant grace centers on his, God's, action in Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. So when you ask for your sanctification, understand this, you're asking for the Holy Spirit. Back to what your prayer, what my prayer should focus on first and foremost, the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? What should wake me up in the morning? What should I pray for? Lord, give me your Holy Spirit. Let me walk in your Holy Spirit today. Because that's the only way I'm going to hallow his name in my own life, right? So look at this. We'll get to this later, but it's right here in Luke 11. Jesus says in verse 9, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. What's he talking about in verse 9? That my dog wins the award as the best dog in Starkville? Is that what I'm supposed to be mainly praying about? Well, let's go to verse 13. Where is prayer heading us? Where is the way Jesus teaching us to pray heading us? Look at this. If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? There it is. That's the goal of prayer. The gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And now finally, number five. This is my invitation to you from the beginning. Start practicing now and growing in the one part of the prayer we will exclaim forever. There is one part of the prayer that Jesus teaches us that we will exclaim forever. And that's the answer to all the other requests. Father, hallowed be your name. May your name be upheld as holy. Let me explain this to you. In the age to come, we will not need to ask anymore for the coming of God's kingdom because Jesus will have returned and the kingdom will be here. Do you understand? You will no longer need to pray, thy kingdom come. You will no longer need to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because it will be consummated in the reign of Christ when he returns. You will not need to pray for daily bread because you'll no longer be concerned about that need in your eternal communion with God. You will definitely not need to pray for forgiveness of the sins you committed on the given day because you will be freed from the power of sin in the resurrection that is to come in your glorification in Christ. Christian, do you understand the good news here? You will not be praying about forgiveness of sins in heaven and in the age to come when heaven comes down on earth. Nor will you be praying about deliverance from temptation 
and evil and the evil one because Satan will be eternally vanquished and you will be free from all the forces of evil in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. All the other prayers go away, but one remains and it shifts from adoration petition all the way back to adoration. Hallowed be your name. And if you tell me you're going to get bored with that prayer, you have not been listening or you do not know the living God because his name and the glory of his name are inexhaustible. Glory forever. So I want to invite you today to begin practicing and praying for real what you will pray forever in the kingdom that is to come and in the presence of God himself. Oh, your name is wonderful, Lord. Hallowed be your name. Number one prayer, now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.